Who is the greatest? Some people say that it's LeBron James. Some say that it's Michael Jordan. Wait, guys, that was, that was a little, uh, little preemptive. That wasn't a vote yet. <laughs> so today, it's going to be decided once and for all. Whatever gets decided here, nobody else outside of this room can ever override. So if you are here today and you think that LeBron James is the greatest basketball player of all time, make a bit of noise. Two, three, four, five. Five of us. Fantastic. And if you're here today and you'd say, no, Michael Jordan is hands down the greatest basketball player of all time, make some noise. It was close. It was really close. LeBron almost had it. Well, let's decide it. Michael Jordan's the greatest basketball player of all time. What was he, six for six? I think LeBron's four for ten in NBA Finals. Just saying. So the next question is, who is the greatest of all time when it comes to Chicago baseball teams? <laughs> if you're here in the room today and you say the Chicago White Sox are the greatest Chicago baseball team, make some noise. And if you're like, nah, it's the Cubs. Make some noise for the Cubs. That actually was close. I think the Cubs may have taken it on that one. Is it the Cubs? It sounded like the Cubs. Congratulations, we're a Cubs church now. All the White Sox fans, there's another church down the road for you. I'm just, I'm kidding. So one that is near and dear to my heart is what is the greatest Chicagoland area fast food dirty burger? You have three options. One is Culver's, two is Five Guys, three is Portillo's. Who's here and says Culver's has the best burger in the Chicagoland area for fast food joints? <laughs> Thurston, you thumbs down? Haters, man. What about Five Guys? Who says Five Guys has the best burger? Ooh. All right, Five Guys beats Culver's. And who says Portillo's has the best burger? All right, the correct answer is that all of you are wrong. The answer is actually D, none of the above, because we all know the best burger in the Chicago area is Shake Shack. That's right. Don't, don't knock until you try it. Drive to Oak Brook. Give it a try. It will absolutely change your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch some flack for that one in the foyer afterwards. Portillo's it is. No, no Portillo's? All right. I still say Shake Shack. We'll leave that one undecided. But people have long argued about who is the goat, who is the greatest. And in fact, Jesus' disciples even argued amongst themselves who was the greatest. The Gospel of Luke tells us that an argument started among the disciples as to which of them was the greatest. The book of Mark, it tells us that they came to Capernaum, and when, uh, when he was in the house, Jesus asked them, what were you guys arguing about on the road? But it tells us that they kept silent because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. So imagine this, they're all on the road arguing about who's the best, who's the greatest. I've healed more people than you. I'm a better apostle than you. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I'm the man. I'm the, I'm the best. And then they get to their destination and Jesus goes, hey, um, what were you guys talking about back there? And it tells us they literally got silent. Nothing, Jesus. Just how much we love you. How awesome it is to follow you. How humble it is just to serve you. Right? They were arguing about who was the greatest. And what I find so interesting if you read this whole story is that Jesus does not rebuke them for wanting to be great. What he does rebuke them for is how they want to become great. There's a huge misconception in the church today where so many Christians think they're not supposed to be great. And that's a mistake. Because the Bible tells us that you are the head and not the tail. You are more than a conqueror. You are a co-heir with Christ. You are strengthened with all power. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That you have the mind of Christ. You have power and authority over the enemy. That you will overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. You will cast out demons, you will speak in new tongues, you will pick up serpents with your hands, you will drink deadly poison, it will not hurt you, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover, that you are the light 
of the world. God wants you to be great. The question is not, does God want you to be great? The question is, how does God want you to become great? The title of the message today is, How to Become Great in God's Kingdom. Do you want to become great? Do you want to become great? I hope and I pray so. I hope and I pray that we're not here going, well, I just want my life to be meaningless and I want to just exist, see nothing happen through my life, see God not do anything through me, and then I just kind of want to, you know, get to the end of my life and look back and see that there's nothing different had I not existed on this earth. Hopefully that's not where we're at. You and I should want to be great. God wants you to be great, but maybe it's our definition of greatness that needs to shift. God told David, who was considered the greatest king of Israel. If you look at an example of someone who was great, it was David. And God says this to David. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people. I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies before you. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on earth. And it continues to say, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Who would love to have God say this to you? It's worth noting that even Jesus himself comes through David's family tree. So there is something significant about David. There were some things that he did. There were some ways that he acted. There was some ways that he went about things that actually postured himself for God to be able to make him great. And that's what we're going to look at today is why did God choose David? God could have chose anybody. And so there's some things about David that qualified him to be chosen by God and to become great. And if we understand what those are, then we can also position and posture ourselves for greatness in the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that when David was young, one of the prophets goes to his house and says to his dad, Jesse, I'm going to pick one of your sons and I'm going to anoint them to be the next king of Israel. And so Jesse lines up all seven of his sons. And we pick up the story here. It says, Jesse had seven sons pass before Samuel, who was the prophet. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked David, are these all the sons you have? And Jesse said, there is still the youngest. So David did not even get invited to the meeting. It tells you how much even his own dad believed in him. uh, He's not here. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So they sent for him and they had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So there's an anointing ceremony. We're going to pick the next king, someone who's going to become great. And David literally doesn't even get invited. And what is David doing? He's out in the field looking after the sheep. What David is doing is David is serving. If you want to become great in the kingdom of God, you need to learn how to serve. It's because David was faithful in serving in the field that actually positioned him to be chosen by God. Because when you and I serve in the quiet place, in insignificant spaces where no one else is watching, if you and I will be faithful serving there, it's actually what forms our character within us. There's three things we can learn from David. The first is that serving forms you in private. It is serving in obscurity, in quietness, that God actually builds character and he builds humility. And the Bible tells us that God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. I think we have a huge problem in the church today that we misunderstand humility. We think humility is thinking that we're nothing and and God is everything, which I mean, to a sense, that's true, but we think, like, I, I suck, I'm not very good, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, I'm, but, a, I'm but a worm, I'm terrible, and, and, and you know, and I'm nothing. And that's not actually humility. That What that is, is that's insecurity. If someone walks into the room and they're prideful, 
They walk in and they think, I'm better than everybody. I'm better than that person. I'm better than that person. I'm a big deal. I'm so much better than everybody else here. Who are they thinking about? Themselves. If someone walks into a room and they're insecure and they're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not very good. I'm not as good as that person. I'm not as good as that person. I'm not as good as them. I'm, 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 not, I'm not important enough to be here. Who are they thinking about? Themselves. Pride and insecurity are two sides of the same coin. And the root cause of it is selfishness and self-centeredness, where we're so focused on ourself that we cannot see anybody else. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis that I love. It says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So instead of walking into a room and thinking, I'm better than them, I'm better than them, I'm better than them, I'm better than them, or oh, I'm not as good as them, I'm not as good as them, I'm not as good as them, instead of being prideful or insecure, what if we walked into a room and said, God, how can I serve you? God, who can I serve? Who can I bless? Oh, look at that person over there. I wonder if I can bless them. Who am I focused on now? God and people, not myself. And that's what happens when we develop humility. When Juliet and I were not yet dating and didn't even know each other, um, I don't know what you guys did when, you know, if you're single, maybe you have this, or maybe if you once upon a time were single, then you maybe had this. Anybody write like a list of like what you want to have in a future spouse? One person? You all are liars. I know you're liars. <laughs> so I had one. And one of the things that I wrote down was obviously I knew they needed to love Jesus. That was 100% a non-negotiable for me. But the second was I knew that anybody I was going to date or potentially marry, I had to see examples of them serving other people in some area of their life. Because the biggest encouragement I can give to anybody who's single or dating or trying to figure stuff out is if you look at somebody else, I, I just want to give you a, a, a hint on what happens in marriage. In marriage, you love and you serve the other person. And if you walk in and you try and get your own needs met by them and both people are taking out of the relationship, your marriage is gonna wind up being empty. But if you walk into a marriage and you say, how can I love you? How can I bless you? How can I serve you? And if they have the same posture back, there's gonna be an overflow in your marriage. And so if you're like, hey, should I date this person? Should I not? My recommendation, make sure they love Jesus, number one. But number two, see if they're serving in some area of their life. Because if you walk into a relationship with somebody and they are not serving anybody other than themselves in any area of their life, what do you think is going to happen when you get into a relationship with that person? It's probably not going to just magically transform. And special shout out, that's why I love Josh, who's running sound, and Megan. Where's Megan at? Next to Josh, she's in the back. I see you guys. You guys are getting married in a couple weeks. They met in church serving. So I wouldn't have dated somebody who wasn't serving somewhere in some area of their life. It's also worth noting that David was anointed king, but there was a 20-year gap to when he actually became king. And I think sometimes... God speaks to us about something or, you know, we feel like we're supposed to go do something with our life someday. And if we don't get it in a week, we want to quit and give up. Oh, God told me that I'm going to go do this. Seven days later. God, it's so hard waiting this long. David literally had a prophet of the Lord anoint him. You were going to be the king of Israel. And it didn't happen for 20 years. I think sometimes God tests us to see if we're going to be faithful in the gap. So it wasn't just that David served and then God chose him and then he stopped serving, but David continued to serve. In 1 Samuel 17, it tells us that Jesse, David's dad, said to him, take this ephah of roasted grain and 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. The brothers were fighting against the Philistines. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So David has been anointed king of Israel, the future king of Israel. And his dad goes to him and says, hey, David, can you go deliver some lunch to your brothers? Do you want to be an Uber driver for the day? And you can imagine what David might have done or what maybe some people might do. Maybe turn to their dad and say, are you kidding me? 
do you know who I am? I am anointed to be the future king of Israel. How dare you ask me to go deliver lunch to my brothers? I'm not going to serve them. I'm the, I'm the future king. They should be serving me. But that's not what David does. David says, okay, dad, I want to serve God. I want to serve you. I want to serve my brothers. Let's do this. He delivers the lunch. And the Bible says that he takes them to lunch, and as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out of his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. So David, who's famous for the story of David and Goliath, where he killed a giant as a young kid, never would have gotten the opportunity if he hadn't been faithful in serving his dad and serving his brothers. It was precisely because he served his dad, he served his brothers, that he was positioned for that door that God was going to open. And so David says, well, I'll fight him. The king hears about it, says, hey, send that guy over here. I want to meet this guy. And David says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Servant does not just, serving does not just form you in private. It actually positions you for breakthrough. And I will say opportunities for breakthrough often come in the form of a battle. Sometimes we think if God ever opens a door, it's just going to be easy. If God gives me a promotion, it just means that I'm going to step in, I'm going to get more pay, more responsibility, but it's going to be easier than what I'm doing now. Probably not. And so sometimes God will open a door, but that door actually looks like a fight. God opened a door of opportunity for David, and it looked like fighting a giant. When I was, my first job out of college, I was in New York. I was doing business consulting. And I started serving in church really for the first time over an extended period of time in my life. And I started to love building God's house more and more every week. And I started to not like <laughs> helping Microsoft raise their stock price by a penny. It just, and again, I, I, everyone's called the different areas of life. But I, I, knew that, I knew that building church was something I wanted to do um, more and more and more. And I was like, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And so I got involved in church and I started serving. I started serving on the host team. And then after two years, one of the pastors said, hey, have you ever thought about Bible college? I said, I've never really thought about it. He goes, great, I think you should do it. So I went to Bible college in Australia and it was this opportunity that I had to go do that. But I will say, moving all the way across the world to the other side of the world, to an island in the middle of nowhere, in the barren wasteland of Australia. I'm joking a little bit. But it was a fight. And I was there on a student visa, which meant that I couldn't work full time. I could only work very limited hours. And there was weeks where I did not have enough money to buy food that week. And I was working, working that, my, my maximum hours I possibly could and trying to barely make it. And so going to Bible college in Australia may sound sexy, but I will tell you, it was a fight. And I thought about quitting many, many, many times. And I'm grateful that I didn't because on the last conference, before I was about to finish up Bible college, I was serving at a conference and I randomly bumped into another pastor from London through a mutual friend. And the guy, like, we started talking and kind of got to know each other a little bit. And he said, you have no idea, but I have been waiting years for, to meet somebody who had a business background and wanted to build a business ministry for church. He goes, none of the business people in my church want to do it, but I think that you might be the right person if you want to come out to London and join staff and be a part of this, I'll sponsor your visa. I'll take care of everything. All you have to do is say yes. And that door opened because I was serving. And obviously I did a lot of things wrong when I was in Australia. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I will say I've noticed that when we serve, it opens doors of opportunity and it opens doors that God has ahead of us. And even moving to London was a fight. Brand new city, never been to London. London can be hard. It was a fight. But when we serve, God actually opens doors of opportunity. And the Bible tells us to not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. People who have the posture of a servant don't give up when it gets inconvenient. The Israelites ran from the fight, but David decided to step up to fight. And he says this, uh, the king says to him, you are not able to go fight against the Philistine. You're only a young man. He has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Your servant has been serving. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, 
rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hairs, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Was it just the verse you guys were getting excited about? All right, cool. I thought maybe a photo was behind me. But David steps up, everybody else runs away. And David says to the king, I was faithful serving my dad's sheep. He's faithful serving his dad and his brother shows up, hears about Goliath, says, hey, I'll go fight him. And then he goes to the king and says, your servant is here, I'll go fight him. And what Saul said to him is, you're not ready, you're too young. And what David says is, no, I've been faithful serving my father's sheep. Now I'm willing to bet that if somebody, probably most of the young men in Israel were watching sheep and a lion or a bear grabbed one of the sheep and ran away with it. I'm just going to take a guess that most of the Israelites would have said, well, finders keepers. I mean, he could have it. I mean, no one's really going to notice. Might as well. I mean, it's not worth my life to trade for the life of just a sheep, but not David. David was in so faithful in his, ser- in his serving that he went after the lion and the bear. And it's because he was faithful in his serving that he actually developed the ability that he would need to use to kill Goliath. David never would have been able to defeat Goliath if he had not been faithful serving his father's sheep and killing lions and bears. I think sometimes we pray and we're like, God, I want a promotion or I want this or I want that. God, open these doors of opportunity. But If that door of opportunity came, the question is, are you ready? Are you prepared? Because if someone's in a job, like if if I'm working one job and I'm not faithful in it and I'm not serving in it because I'm like, well, this isn't what I want to be doing long term, so I'm just not going to be faithful here. But someday I'll be faithful when I get the job I really want. What happens is the job I'm not being faithful in here, I'm not building those muscles that I'm going to need for when I step into the job that God actually moves me into. And so if you're here and you're like, Lord, make me a CEO. Great. If God made you a CEO tomorrow, you'd probably last two weeks. I'm I'm hypothetical. I'm joking. But you get what I'm saying, right? If you step into something you're not prepared for, it's actually going to be damaging. And so I think sometimes God doesn't give us more because we're not faithful where we're at and we haven't built the muscles that we need to be able to step into what God actually wants to move us into. Serving is what strengthens the gift that God has given you. The Bible says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. So God has given you a gift. You are unique. You are one of a kind. God put intentional thought and design into you. You have something to offer that nobody else has that exact same thing to offer. You are essential and you are needed. Is my girl trying to come up on stage? Okay, all right. Um, (laughs) Where was I? So God has made you unique and given you a specific gift or a set of gifts, and it's incredibly needed. But if we don't exercise those gifts and we don't apply those gifts and we don't use those gifts, the gifts God has given you are for you, but they're not for you. The Bible says you have a gift, use it to serve one another. So God's given you a gift, but if you're not serving one another, you're not actually exercising the gift. And it's kind of like going to the gym. If someone who's never lifted a weight before in their life walks into the gym and tries to bench press 500 pounds, what's going to happen? They may get decapitated by that barbell because they're not prepared to be able to handle the weight. But if they start with where they're at and they exercise it over the course of weeks, months, years, they develop and they build up and they strengthen that gift so that someday they can step in and they may be able to bench press hundreds of pounds. But it's something that we have to start where we're at and serve. And I think for Juliet and I, the Bible talks about equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And so Juliet and I, as the pastors of this church, we're not here because we want to be the greatest in in terms of like the most important. We are here because we want to serve you and we want to equip you to be able to minister. You are the saints and it's your job to do the ministry and our ministry is actually helping make you great. That's Juliet and I's entire role, is we want to make you great. And so sometimes, if you're, anybody ever have a trainer at the gym? Right, sometimes a trainer comes at you and kind of gets in your face a little bit. Come on, push it, let's go. There's more in you than that. 
You can do it. Let's go. And sometimes Juliet and I will get a little bit in your face and say, come on, there's more in you. You've got this. Exercise it. Use it. And the reason that we push you is because we love you. And the reason we push you is because we want you to be great. And that's why we're trying to encourage you to serve today. Because it's when you serve that God builds that gift on the inside of you. The truth is that nothing great ever comes easy. It didn't come easy for David. It didn't come easy for Jesus. And how many of you know that David was great, but he was still not the goat? Jesus is the greatest of all time. Jesus is described as, in the Bible as our redeemer, the prince of peace, the good shepherd, and the worship team can come and join, the alpha and the omega, Emmanuel, our mediator, the bread of life, the fountain of living waters, the way, the truth, and the life, the king of kings, God himself. And Jesus is alive today, and he is alive forevermore. Jesus is the goat. And do you know what Jesus did with his life? He served. He said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's a huge difference between what the world defines as greatness and what Jesus defines as greatness. In the world, something, serving is something you do for a season. I'll work my way up in this company, or I'll serve for a while, and I'll serve others, and eventually something flips, and I become important enough that I no longer have to serve, and now I have other people who serve me. And the more people who serve me, then the greater I am. That's the world's definition of what it means to serve. We do it for a season until we graduate from it. But in Jesus' realm, you never graduate from serving. And in fact, the greater you are, the more you serve. Serving is not something you do for a season that you graduate from. Once you become great, Jesus says that when you serve, you are great in the midst of your serving. Jesus says this, he says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. In the beginning, I asked, do you want to become great? Do you want to become great? I hope so. If you and I want to become great in God's kingdom, it starts with serving. It starts with a place of service. And I do want to just clarify um, a distinguish between serving and uh, joining a team in church, right? Serving is so much bigger and broader. David served his dad, he served God, he served his brothers, he served his king. Serving is, is everywhere. I'm not just talking about serving on a Sunday team. Serving on a Sunday team in church is just one avenue for you to serve. That's just one way for you to serve, but serving is so much bigger than that. So I'm not just talking about joining a team. But Galatians does tell us that as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. If you serve others in Jesus' church, it will strengthen your ability to serve everywhere. So the Bible tells us is that we're to serve and do good to everybody, but especially those in the body of Christ. And so Julia and I, every single week, we get up and we're like, hey, join team, join team, serve, get involved. And the reason why we do that is not so that a lawn church can grow. Though if more people jump in and serve, obviously the church will grow because we're gonna be able to do more, but that's not why. It's not so that Juliet and I can see you more and hang out with you more. Though if someone, anyone who joins team, we do get to see you more and hang out with them more, especially at team prayer and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not so that Juliet and I can brag to our other pastor friends about uh, how awesome our team is. Though we often talk to other pastors about how amazing our team is. The reason that we want you to serve in every area of life, and the reason we invite you to serve on team every week is because we want you to be great. When you serve, you are great in the kingdom of God. And so I just want to encourage every single person here that if you're here today and maybe you're like, hey, I, I know that God is speaking to me about areas I need to serve, that's amazing. We're gonna take a moment and just wait on God for a minute. And my hope and my prayer is that God speaks to you about where you can serve. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a family, maybe it's a relationship, whatever it is, where can you serve? Where can you serve God? Where can you serve others? But I'm willing to bet for a lot of us, that probably looks like us stepping in and joining a team in church. And so if you are here and maybe you've been around for a while and you're like, you know what, this is the time to jump in and get involved, I want to encourage you to join team. Or maybe you're here and you're brand new, maybe this is your first Sunday 
and you're like, I don't even know anybody yet. Well, congratulations, you're new, and this is also a church plant, so we're all new. So we're all figuring this out together. I wanna encourage you to jump in and join team and serve because when you serve, it forms you in private. It positions you for breakthrough and it strengthens you for the purpose that God has for you. We want you to serve because we want you to be great. There's one other thing I wanna qualify this with is there are some people in our church that we actually tell not to serve and not to get involved. So I just wanna put a little asterisk on that. How do you say asterisk? All right. So if you have maybe come out of a church background where something's happened and you've been really hurt in the church or maybe you've just served and you feel like you're, you're like, I just, I, I, you know, I, I, maybe you just moved here, but you served in another church where you were from and you're like, I just got really burnt out. Juliet and I actively encourage everyone like that to not serve and just to sit in and to heal. Because it's like if you have a, like a broken leg, right? And you're like, I don't need to rest. I'm just gonna keep running on it. What's gonna happen? You can make it worse. It's gonna be unhealthy for you and it's gonna be bad for everybody else too. So if you are here and you're like, you know what, I've been hurt in church. I just, I need a season of rest and healing. Take it. Don't feel any obligation to jump in and join team because you need to heal. But I will say that after you've broken a bone, it needs to heal for a certain amount of time. But then what happens if you never start using it again? It atrophies. You lose strength. It actually can be damaging to you. And so maybe you're here and maybe you've been hurt kind of a while back. You maybe had that time to heal. And now you're like, you know what? This is the time I wanna jump back in. I wanna encourage you to jump back in. But it's up to you to kind of read, is my leg still broken or is it now healed up and I need to start using it and start being able to exercise it? I think we have a slide with um, different ways to join team. I think it's a connect card slide. And I will say for Juliet and I, um, Anybody in this room who takes a connect card out or fills it out online and ticks, join a team. Juliet and I are gonna text you this week and we're gonna try and find a time with you to have a phone call. And on that call, we wanna figure out from you how God's wired you, gifted you, what the best fit for you is on team and to be able to jump in because we wanna help you to serve and we wanna help you to be great. So if you, if you fill out that connect card, Juliet and I will follow you up with you this week. Can we jump up to our feet? We're gonna sing a song in a minute called Come to the Altar. But before we do that, I wanna just take a minute because as I mentioned, serving is so much bigger than joining team. And I actually pray and believe that in this moment that God's gonna to speak to you about where can you serve. So many people come to God and say, God, I want this, I want that. I need you to help me with this. I need you to help me with that. You know what I don't think God hears as much as he'd like to hear? God, what can I do to serve you? God, what can I do for you? God, I'm not coming to you right now asking anything from you. I'm coming to you saying, I wanna be in your presence. I wanna commune with you. God, I wanna serve you. What is it you wanna do? So in this moment, let's wait on God for a minute and just ask God. Say, God, what can I do? And I actually believe there's people in this room that have struggled to hear God's voice. And you're like, I just, I just haven't been hearing him the way that I want to. If we come to God and we say, God, what is it you wanna do? I promise you that you are positioning yourself to be able to hear from God because God wants to speak to you. If someone comes to God and says, God, what can I do to serve you? Why would God not want to speak to you? He'll probably start bringing up people and you know, people you need to forgive or things that he wants you to go do. So let's pause for a minute and just ask God, God, what can I do to serve you? And the last group of people we're gonna pray for is those who maybe have never made a decision to follow Jesus. Or at one point in your life, you made that decision, but if you're honest with yourself, you've kind of veered off track and walked away from God. And today you wanna to come back and you wanna rededicate your life to him today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, you're saying today, I need a relationship with Jesus. I don't just need my feet washed, I need my whole body washed. I need my soul cleansed from the inside out. I need to be forgiven of every single thing I've done, past, present, and future. If that's you today, I need a relationship with Jesus or I've wandered off and like the prodigal son, I need to come back to him today. If that's you, put your hand up and give me a wave. Put your hand up, give me a wave. Amazing, thank you. I see you in the front, thank you. I see you in the side. Thank you, I see you in the middle. Fantastic. Thank you. I'll see you in the back. Anybody else? You want to give your life to Jesus today? You want a relationship with the living God? Praise God. You can go ahead and look up here. The Bible says in Romans that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. 
And so by you putting your hand up, that's you saying, hey, I believe in my heart. And now I want to help you to confess or to speak out with your mouth. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you put your hand up, repeat after me. And we're all going to say this with you because we're in this together. So repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. I've messed up. I have messed up. And I need your forgiveness. I need your forgiveness. And today I choose, today I choose to, follow you. to follow you. It's by your grace, by your grace that, I'm that I'm saved. And by your power, by your power that I'm set free. I'm set free. It's a new day. In Jesus' name, Jesus name. Amen, amen, amen. Let's give everybody a big hand who prayed that prayer today.